this is a comics podcast, and this is your host, Ilana Levin, a.k.a. Ilana Brooklyn. This is the show for people who know that there are no comics without artists and that art is work. I'm joined this evening with an artist who's doing really beautiful work, Nick Robles. Nick is a freelance artist from Southern Louisiana. He's self-taught. He works with digital art as his main medium. He's dabbled in the arts as far back as he can remember, whether it be drawing, writing, or music, and he can't see the dabbling going away anytime soon, which is good for us. He's been published by numerous clients like Boom, IDW, Black Crown, Vault, and Dark Horse. And he continues to grow that list with a love of art and creating with passionate storytellers. His most recent book, Euthanauts, with writer Teeny Howard, who's been on the show to talk about the book before, actually, uh, has its first volume dropping on February 27th. For the description of Euthanauts, Death is like space, a seemingly unknowable, terrifying blackness that yields incredible discoveries and truths. If only you've got the right kind of rocket ship. What if suicide isn't a desire to die, but a desire to be somewhere else? What if there is a place we can go after death, but we have no way to phone home about it? What if the Freudian death instinct is not destructive, but discovery? After a near-death experience, lonely funeral home receptionist Talia Rosewood is recruited into the Euthanauts, a select group of psychonauts, sick folk, and other intrepid explorers who pass over willingly to determine what lies beyond... Teeny Howard combines her trademark black humor and grounded realistic storytelling with an otherworldly and mind-expanding exploration of the one thing we have in common in this collection of the first five issues. Welcome to the show, Nick. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so glad we were able to do this. I um, I really have loved the art. It was one of the first things that struck me when I checked out Euthanauts. And, um, mm-hmm. But I, I think I first saw you just posting fan art on tumblr i'm not tumblr i'm sorry uh, on twitter it was probably on tumblr too <laughs> oh really okay then both of them um <laughs> so uh and then it was great to see that oh you're actually attached to a book that i'm excited to read that it's even better um but you mentioned in your bio that you were self-taught and i just learned that and i'm actually kind of shocked because you're technically <laughs> so freaking good oh. so tell me how 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 did that happen <laughs> oh thank you um um i come from a uh, an artistic family really and just everyone dabbles in something whether it be sewing or painting or drawing just anything but i think i'm the only one that tried to turn into or turn it into a career so it's it's just been persistent drawing and studying on my own Mm -hmm. and i i've been lucky to have a family that really encourages me and uh (laughs) i think my dad was the only one that wasn't the 100% encouraging until he saw a paycheck from something I did. <laughs> sure. So yeah, that 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 happened. <laughs> so I've got support from all over, and I it's it's the cliche, but I've been drawing forever, and I I just don't see anything else happening for me. I I fall mm-hmm. I've fallen in love and continue to love what I do, and just to. To keep learning and getting better is my main goal. I, I love storytelling, and I love just pushing myself to get to a point where where it keeps me excited. And it's, I, I think I remember seeing, um, way back when, before I did digital art, I was into drawing and painting, and I was going to be an oil painter. I was going mm. to be one of the masters and all of that. And <laughs> um I, I had a love for Todd Lockwood. He does a lot of, or he did a lot of Forgotten Realms art back in the day. And oh yeah. He um, he made the switch to digital. I think he was one of my main just fanboy artist people that I'd love to just go online and just. It, I remember going online at night and just like, I gotta go see if anybody updated anything. And this was before Twitter or anything, so it was just like us a slow updating to their websites and <laughs> you know how today updating websites isn't as quick as yeah. Twitter or Tumblr or what have you because you just you don't you don't have the auto click let me post this little drawing I did no you have to go like out of your way to look at things yeah, yeah. and this was years ago and I remember Todd actually sent me a CD once when I emailed him I was like hey can you teach me how to do stuff or how do you um, paint this or that? And I was just looking for a mentorship of some sort because mm-hmm. self-taught mostly. 
So he was nice enough to send me a CD with a, um, I think it was a step-by-step -step tutorial, yeah. And it just had all his steps and everything, and I just thought that was great that some amazing artist that I adored and just looked up to took the time to send me something. Wow. So That's really cool. Yeah. And um, I think I dodged the question, though. <laughs> no, it's, 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 I mean, it's really, I, I, I never was able to make the transition at all to digital media. Like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, I, I, to this day, if I'm going to draw somebody's birthday card, which I've been known to do, like, I'm still going to pull out a piece of paper and draw on paper. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just always amazing to me, like, how do you, how shifting to the other, to, shifting to digital medium from working on paper. I think I switched, oh, goodness. I was a teenager, I know. Mm -hmm. So um, I remember getting my first tablet because I, I did the mouse method for a long time too. Yeah. Oh my God. That that I was mean, horrible. But no. do you remember some people who could do it so well? Yeah. I mean, there was literally nothing else, and then in 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 the late '80s and early '90s, I don't understand how that's physically possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That I remember people used to use tablets for the drawing, but people that used mouses or yeah, mouses, whatever. <laughs> they yeah. were more colorists and that mm -hmm. type of stuff. So I had a mouse for a while, and I, I remember searching eBay and all that, looking for a cheap tablet. And I, I can't remember the first one I got. I just remember it was this big gray plastic thing, and I, I, I did what I could with it. And wow. I don't remember when I finally got up to a Wacom. But it was a game changer, of course, from yeah. a mouse. That's like really the standard, I think, for most artists who work digitally now. Yeah. Oh, I, I've wow. been seeing more and more other brands pop up here and there, but, you know, Wacom's the, the, the big name. Um, with one of the things that I struck, just strikes me so much about your art is like you are wonderful at drawing human figures. And for a lot of people, that is the piece of it that was really necessary to kind of have through traditional training because of the sheer quantity of life figure life like fit live figure drawing you get to do in those contexts so that mm -hmm. was one of the reasons why i was super surprised to hear you were self-taught because i'm just like wow you really draw bodies so well um <laughs> and your anatomy is so damn good uh that Thank was one you. of the things that really drew me to your art so so yeah how do you approach that um funny you should mention figure drawing <laughs> i um i keep trying to get back into the habit of doing it every morning even mm -hmm. i mean it's not live figure drawing but they're like uh youtube sites or playlists and what have you where it'll have timed videos or um i don't use stills they they actually record the model for one minute and or three minutes what have you and you draw from that so it's mm. it's it's digital figure drawing so yeah. i do that and figures have that's the thing that everyone tries to drill into your head that you need to know that if you want to do comics or or you want to be a figure artist like before mm -hmm. comics, I I wanted to be a painter. I wanted to do like uh, Jade uh, Waterhouse or Todd Lockwood or mm -hmm. um, Lion Decker or Brom. Yeah. Um, do you know Gerald Brom? Gerald Brom, no, I know Lion Decker. Who, Gerald Brom? Uh, uh, he's so. a very gothic, dark, fantasy painter. Um, beautiful stuff. He was a huge cool. inspiration to me. And uh, Lion Decker, I found him later yeah. and. I, I fell in love, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I tend to love figure artists who focus on the figure, and it's just, I've always been that, I've always wanted to be that, so I I will take too long to draw figures, probably, I need, I need to work on my shorthand, but I just, I get lost in finding the right, just the right lines and right curves and just the language, it's, it's, mm. it's my favorite thing, really. I mean, maybe it drives you crazy, but for me as someone, like, it just completely paid off. Like, I can see the amount of care and specificity. Like, everybody's body parts work together and move, and the figures are doing things that bodies do. And it's interesting in, in Euthanauts because you're doing a story where people are, there's a lot of stuff that's very hallucination-y. Um, there's yeah. like also like literally people taking hallucinogens and watching bodies perform on stage <laughs> in one particular scene uh, in sort of a Cirque du Soleil kind of a setting. 
um, and you know you have different people like moving around at like an orgy, and then there's just there's different mm-hmm. kinds of bodies that we're viewing through different kinds of contexts of substances or not, but they all work. Um, and it's and it's funny because I think a lot of uh, artists would actually just have used those as an opportunity to not have to be as diligent with mm-hmm. their mechanics and you're like no I'm still sticking to this <laughs> and I, I appreciate that aesthetically <laughs> thank you um just I I think I, I I've, I've already said that I'm in love with like the figures and everything but just mm-hmm. if you have that opportunity you can you can take it and explore different body types and and especially in that type of scene it's it's nice to see it's that's one of my favorite things people come back from reading euthanauts is when they mention that my body types are diverse yes that's that's one of my favorite things and just to hop off that um i've seen a couple people who were hesitant to read it just because of the contents and they've mentioned that it made them feel better about um the death and death positive industry and that movement and mm. the fact that a comic book, and I don't mean that as a, um, as a bad thing, Pejorative, can make people yeah. feel better. I mean, that's like a huge goal for a creative person. If you can make someone feel something like that, that's, that's amazing. And that's mostly teeny because I'm, I'm just drawing pictures, but I'm, I'm happy to bring an element to that to make people feel something. And mm. just... Those those are my two favorite things people come back from euthanauts with. I mean, any, anything positive is great, but those two just stick out to me. How did you guys connect for the project? Um, that's Shelley Bond. <laughs> uh, she, I was I was looking for work, and I had done some fan art for Kid Lobotomy, and I'm oh. I'm kind of buds with Tess Fowler, and I kind of she's been my comic mom, my comic aunt, <laughs> my comic guardian, <laughs> so she kind of dropped my name and I think Shelly was just like oh cool his stuff's awesome let's get back to work and then I did fan art and then I guess sometimes it takes a picture <laughs> and she's like oh okay and so I got noticed that way and then I kind of mentioned um, that I was looking for work and she had pitches in her um, in her schedule that didn't have an artist attached yet and Youth and was one of those and I wow. happily jumped on uh, yeah, you guys are such a great fit. I actually would have assumed that you'd kind of come in as a pairing. That's wild. Um, because there's such a, a a connection to sort of like classic vertigo in terms of the subject matter of euthanauts um, as sort of being an exploration of our connections to death and to our families and also to like liminal states and uh, breaking barriers of the mind and that, all that. And um, mm-hmm. that's like very, very, you know, ni- like old school vertigo, 80s, 90s vertigo. And, and um, I definitely see that connection in your art as well, stylistically. Thank you. <laughs> I, um, you know, I've never been like the hugest comic reader. So everyone always has been drawing um, lines to vertigo from this. And um, I think the only thing I was familiar with was Sandman. I've mm-hmm. read a lot of Sandman and mm-hmm. just, I, I think doing this and working with Teeny and Shelly, I've found a... Um, I found a comfortable spot with my work and I think that vertigo vibe or whatever it is that people kind of associate it with is really good for me to draw. Mm-hmm. Uh, that may sound silly, but it's just... No, it's... Yeah. It's, it's, I found a fit and, <laughs> and it works for mm-hmm. me. And I, I was very lucky to work with Teeny because she... I, I clicked with her really well and I still... I like to call her... I like to bug her still. Like today I was bugging her about doing a Nightwing book or something. <laughs> yes, you guys should do a Nightwing book or something. Yes, um, I, I would love that. Actually, she knows that. <laughs> yeah. this, this, leads to two, I have like, this leads to two exact questions. I'm going to put a pen on the Nightwing book and go into the, the thing I was going to say about the Vertigo and style, which is that I don't want people to think that this is like a throwback. Like It's not. Like It's very modern looking and you do a really good job of drawing contemporary people in contemporary clothing. <laughs> and by contemporary, I mean like 2019. I don't mean contemporary as in things from the 90s, right? Oh, right. Um, so like, yeah, like when you're trying to keep people's like looks and styles modern, um, like what, how do you approach that? Um, 
we'll just uh, touch on that. Uh, <laughs> I, it can be a throwback because I'm not too familiar to throw back to. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but for clothes, um, Jen Bartell and Chris Anka, they mm-hmm. are amazing at that, and they have really their um, their choice to really focus on that and bring that to comics has really made me look into it more. So I will. I will take the time to go and look up outfits and things that are current now, and I I didn't before. I was I was very much the shirt and jeans on people or here and there, not not all the time, but I, I was not lazy, but I had a comfortable spot that I stayed to. Mm-hmm. But after seeing them explore and just the character it brings to characters or the figures or just it's a personality trait and I was yeah. ignoring it and I f- now know I was ignoring it so I have made the choice to start looking for outfits and accessories for characters just to bring something more to them yeah that's great and exactly I think that's one of the ways that it pays off um, I mean like the main character of uh, Euthanauts Thalia has this very specific style And what's interesting is that she's, like, not even the only character in that book who has sort of, like, a vaguely goth-associated style, but they don't even dress the same as each other. Like, within Mm -hmm. that range, people don't even have the same look as each other. I'm so happy to hear that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, when you approached character design for the book, like, were you guys, like, how how did you guys work on the actual design for the different characters? Um... Teeny came to me with just the bare bones and a few notes here and there for Thalia. She, um, I think I got her in like two or three major changes or concepts, and um, I, I kind of just did, did sketches here and there of their outfits. I don't know if I shared them all with Teeny and Shelly, but I, I had them on my computer. I, I, I had a home base go to and look and see what would work, and I after you spend time with them, you know what they'd wear. Mm. And, uh, I think Mercy may have been the toughest one. Just, she had a bunch of time jumps. Or, not a bunch, but just a couple. And, mm-hmm. Indy, Indy was my wild card fun, just do whatever. I, th- I think, I, <laughs> I remember I sent Teeny like, a ton of Indy concepts because I kind of fell in love with them. And I, I don't think he was supposed to be as big a figure or a character in Euthanauts, but I'm, I'm, I think I might have made him one. <laughs> right, right. It grew with the uh, enthusiasm for the portrayal. Yeah. And just, um, yeah, I, I had fun designing him, and we had all the little Bowie nods here and there, but he was the one that had all of them. With the, um, the sort of uh, science fiction-y technology in the book, like there's a lot of astronaut helmets and diving bells Mm -hmm. and like how do you sort of decide on what those pieces are going to look like or even be in the first place Mm, that one that's tough one because um i think originally i was doing a moth butterfly suit for talia and i think teeny wasn't crazy about it and i I, i'm sorry a modular fly suit a moth or a butterfly. Oh, a moth or a butterfly <laughs> suit. Sorry. Okay. Yes. No, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, it was it was a little bit too um, on the nose and just a little hokey looking. After doing the whole book, I wouldn't want to do that. So I'm glad she made the choice. Like, <laughs> no, no, let's do astronaut. Let's do Major Tom astronaut suit helmet. And I just I had fun designing that. I didn't want it to be. Um, exact science. I even with the lab shots, I'm, I was so happy when Teeny was like, "It's pseudoscience. Don't worry about it too much. <laughs> just, just, just have fun with it." So that that made all the difference. So I had fun with that, and then Mercy's Euthanaut suit, and it was it was the the Lily, and I got I got to name those two, which was amazing. I'm mm. I'm so happy that Teeny let me have some words here and there that <laughs> that meant the world because usually it's your and I don't mean this is a bad thing to other writers I've worked with. I, I already feel bad saying this, but just like being able to do the art and have a word or two or a sentence here and there, I really felt the connection for the co-creator aspect of this book. 
and mm -hmm. I think that really made a great um, a great um, a, a book for two multiple people working on it's it wasn't yeah. just a hand-me-down thing it wasn't here's the words do the art here's the book we got to go back and forth some and I will say that I'm slow to open up to people and work with them not not that I don't want to I'm I guess it's just shyness and being brave enough to offer ideas especially in this type of book just offering up part of yourself to really make a true creative choice that's 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 tough for me to open up with and teeny was really open and let me have some fun in her her very somewhat scary world but i think <laughs> we made it okay <laughs> we we made we yeah. found a home there in the death space yeah the uh, the other sort of particular creative visuals a lot are just people be people having out of body experiences uh, people on hallucinogens and different altered states mm -hmm. how do you decide how you want to represent those visually i think the um the this Cirque du Soleil scene uh teeny was very she she told me what she wanted but i kind of just went nuts with everything and I, I definitely wanted to see the whole stage and just just bring little bits of death and parts of the character and have them reflect into the scenery mm. and, but have what's going on there still happening like the Trevi's artists and people swinging here and there are rolling through the um, rolling on the large ring things I don't know what they're called <laughs> but yeah. just I wanted to mix it up so much there so it it was very much the character seeing the stage but seeing part of themselves or at least the reader the characters on a high trip they're not saying much anything except <laughs> whatever and uh the other ones like when talia dropped through the the um the lakeside place that was just me um experimenting with abstract lines and patterns it's something i've really fallen in love with recently and it makes for great visual interest and that's what you want really you want interest but if you can differentiate it between different characters and um scenes you just you can really play with a lot of stuff and keep things separated but it's not going to be the same trick over and over and being abstract and playing with that really allows you to get away from a common look. You can explore different lines and patterns and um, I, I don't handle the colors all the time but that was part of it if I had the time or um, even the first issue when Talia uh, not to spoil but she lands on the bathroom floor and I just mm -hmm. I, I, I don't remember how I had the idea or what triggered it but just it happened and I saw it in my head and it was one of those rare moments where I saw the scene directly in my mind how I wanted it to be on paper or pixels what have you <laughs> and I, I was so happy they let me get nuts with the scenes like that even in the death space I, I I had a common look there but I always tried to keep the patterns in the background different or this the line work just to keep interest hmm. cool cool um, and, uh, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's also really interesting that, uh, you're someone who kind of first got as recognized for, for doing fan art. Everybody sort of starts making fan art when they're a kid, whether it's like mm -hmm. drawing Superman on your notebook or continuing to do that as you're older. Um, but there's always this question of like, how do you decide what characters you want to draw and why? Like, what are you drawn to choosing when it's completely up to you? what you can draw um you know i mean as a an artist who is more selfish now people are also going to reach out to you and like commission and you know mm -hmm. ask you to make particular things or, and obviously you have comic projects but but when it comes to just like you're sitting down and you're going to draw a character like how do you decide who you want to draw and why and um what like kind of things do you look for in making a character in a character that you'd want to draw that would make it interest that would that makes them interesting enough to be worthy of drawing um, that, that's that's what I question myself with every day when I sit down to draw something. <laughs> um, I don't know though. Um, 
like I said, I love figures, so that that limits limits it down to every character ever. <laughs> but um, I tend to try and stick to characters I just enjoy drawing over and over. <laughs> With that, that sounds silly, but characters that I've kind of done before, and I, I just see that I have a good handle on drawing them, so I I tend to go back to them, revisit them. It's 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 comfortable to go back there. It just saying Nightwing, I draw him often. He's one of my favorites to draw because I've, I, I find, I find it relaxing because sometimes, if, if I if I want to just turn off my brain and draw something, without thinking too much about it or worrying if this is going to be a, a beautiful composition, is this is this right? Is this is this right? Or <laughs> is this going to be popular? Do I need to worry about it being popular? Do I want to draw just for me? I, I find characters that I'm comfortable with drawing are ones I will go back to. So Nightwing's one of my favorites to go back to, and uh, Nightcrawler, obviously, recently. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and I recently read um, Batwoman. J.H. Uh, Williams' run on it, the... Um, Oh no, the title is escaping me at the moment. But, but yeah, for the uh, Detective Comics, and then it became mm-hmm. the Batwoman solo series. And I, I mentioned that I've fallen in love with abstract lines and stuff, and yeah. I, I found that um, a lot of the Batman crew really lend themselves to that. You can really play with shapes and lines. It's it's mostly because they're solid black mm-hmm. costumes and everything. <laughs> so that that's a very attractive thing to draw for me. So that took the long way around to getting to that point, but oh. things that I can really play with abstract lines have really been attractive to me lately. And even Nightcrawler isn't the most abstract character for um, lines and shapes, but I found rendering his fur and um, his tail is obviously fun to you can have fun with that, but his fur, I found rendering it and finding the mark making in that, it's its so much fun. That's part of the reason I love drawing him now. And mm-hmm. uh, just finding finding characters that offer me to play with that abstract line and flow have been my go-to these days. And its it's something I found with discovering my style. I, I've been telling people that if you want to look for your own style, you have natural flourishes to your line work and your hand, and you should explore those more because it's coming out naturally. Yeah. So there's there's something to that, and it's it's always better to make a confident line. But I, I've been really in love with random flourishes or little squiggles here and there that just they have so much more personality, and I I always get worried that it's not professional enough, but it's got. What? It's it's got like it's not house style or what have you, but it's yeah, thank me. God, house style is so bad. <laughs> I said I it not you, that. so you're okay. Oh, but, thank you. Um, house, thank you. House style is really bad, so that's good. I, I um, worry about that all the time, though. I but, mean, like it's gonna it definitely is gonna make a difference in terms of what you get hired to do, but that's mm-hmm. fine because you're gonna get hired to do things that you want to do, and then the end result is gonna look better because it's not gonna be yes. house style, which I just don't think is very good I, right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I need so. you to call me every day and say that because I I know it in the back of my head, but I still worry. And then it takes a week or so of me stressing out to just I'll accidentally draw something or a character and I'll be like Oh, this is my style. This is what I like to do, and it shows. I'm not stressing over making it look like so and so or this or that. Well, you know, the thing is interesting is like because there's more than one aspect of the industry. So there's the part where like you're getting hired by a publisher to draw something, and certainly mm-hmm. somebody just having like having doing house style and being really really fast are like two of the things that you know the people making hiring decisions will will often make decisions for in terms of versatility and reliability but if you're looking for when but when you're at a when you're at a comic con and you want to see who has lines down the block for their table other than people who are like living legends like neil adams or something the people who have the lines around their block are people whose work is instantly recognizable Mm -hmm. like 
you're lucky if you can make it to the front of Jen Bartel or uh, Babs Tar's mm-hmm. table, right? Like their mm-hmm. tables are swarmed. Now they have great merch, but they also have a style that is instantly recognizable they as do. them. So, you know, it's sort of like it speaks more to the individual fans and like you kind of have like your own cult of supporters. Right, basically. right. Yeah, I, I, I need you to call me like every day now. <laughs> true. So, you know, you're going to get the line around the block of like the people who are oh. all into So that's what that's about. One, one can dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do think the other piece of that is having merch that you can sell really well yourself. Mm-hmm. But you are the king of pinups, and pinups are things people like oh, to no. buy. So, <laughs> Although, so I actually, speaking of Nightcrawler I, and Tails, I wanted to ask about the tail. Like, like actually, one of my friends, when I, when I told them I was interviewing you, was like, ask about the Nightcrawler tail. So I'm going to ask you, like, people don't have tails. So Nightcrawler is someone who is vastly mostly people-shaped. <laughs> Like, there are some differences in his physiology between that and most people's shape. But the tail is, like, how do you, you... There's no live model for, like, where do I deal with this tail? So, like, how do you deal with the mechanics of a tail <laughs> on a person, you know? <laughs> for, for me, that's just that whole abstract line. It's it's a tail. It's a solid two lines and a little point at the end. You can have so much fun with that. That, that can be whole a whole composition changer. Or, or if you don't want to mess with it, it's behind his leg or off screen somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. It's like it always have to. It always has to look like it's like part of the body and not sort of like floating out there. Yeah, you know just what I mean? hanging there, like someone yeah. clipped it on the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and not a cosplay like, tail. <laughs> no. And, yeah. Ex- actually, yes. Exactly. So, like, how do you make sure it doesn't look like a cosplay tail that's clipped onto the back? Like, it's actually alive and part <laughs> of the musculature. Is an interesting question. I just, I, you got to treat it like part of the body and just know anatomy and know that it's part of the spine and or s- some sort part of the spine that doesn't really make sense, but it's a mutant thing, so deal with it, people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it just, I, I like playing with it as a composition thing. It's It's there to have fun with and just make you can use it for anything. You can have them hanging upside down by it, or like I said, you can have it off screen, or you can have it curled in a perfect circle, or a, a little squiggle thing. It's it's a composition element. Yeah, absolutely. That, that and wings. Wings are a nightmare sometimes, but that's... Oh, yeah. Treat them as a composition element. You can hmm. You don't have to show everything. You don't have to draw every feather here and there. You can have them half off screen. You can have them be just a white silhouette or whatever color they are just treat them as a composition element and you've drawn not just like bird wings but lots of bug wings because of euthanauts oh yeah that's that was that was a lot of moss <laughs> and stuff the so symmetry much, so like hmm? do you do you clone the wings to make them symmetrical and then manipulate them after that or like how are you even doing that oh i for like the I, bug um, wings I don't clone them for one, but if if there's a ton of them on one scene, I'll copy and paste a few just yeah. to vary it up. But wings, just I, I've I've gotten where I control moths and butterflies now, <laughs> so that's a new that's skill. That's awesome. That's freaking awesome. That's so much <laughs> detail. Good God. <laughs> you you can just have fun with the designs though, unless you're doing something very specific. Like the death's head moth is where I get specific. But otherwise, it's just have fun and do your own design. No, no one's going to judge you on a moth wing except yourself when you're going over your pages and noticing, oh, I missed that little pattern up. I'm, I'm a failure. <laughs> <laughs> but even like having that symmetry between one wing and the other on, on the same bug, it just seems like a complete nightmare to me. So yeah, I'm if, if it's if it's a, a perfect symmetrical shot of one, I'll flip it. But if it's not just like a straight on shot no I won't flip it I'll try and keep it organic looking that, that's, that's my main goal even with figures and everything organic is my favorite go to place because you don't have to have every line be so confident and that's mm. that's why I'm, <laughs> I'm garbage on mechanical stuff but I'm trying to get better but I, I really love organic st- stuff Yeah. so figures and just you know, anything not industrial, which is funny because I'm drawing some industrial stuff now, but it's kind of 
H.R. Geiger-ish, so Ooh. it's got some organic to it, so yeah. I can get away with some stuff. <laughs> can you tell me what that's for? Um, it's for uh, the book I'm working on with Mags Visaggio. Oh, you're working on a book with Mags Mags. Bleh. You're working on a book with Mags Visaggio. That's I exciting. I am. I, that's all I've seen people say, so I can't say any more. <laughs> okay. Well, two favorites, so that that is great. Um, oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. Um, I like these team-ups. Um, the, the Donna Troy uh, pin-up that you just did like the, today or yesterday mm-hmm. or something like that, I feel like that's the first one of her that you've done. Yeah, um, and I, um, she's probably the titan I know the little, the least about. <laughs> so that, that many was... Many people would say that. <laughs> yeah. But the origin I think... story is confusing. That, that's what I know about her. She has a yeah. confusing background. And uh, yeah, I, I I posted that, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get quizzed or something. My <laughs> my big worry about being a comic artist is being outed as a fake fanboy or something. Oh man. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd like to do all the Titans like that. It's it's been fun to explore that style. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, you know, because there's a particular characters that we sort of associate you with, like, doing art. And I was like, oh, that's a new one. And, and it was great. So sort of mm-hmm. broadening the uh, the palette from which to draw. Um, I, I needed oh. to do that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, actually, so here's this leads to a good question from a Twitter account, Imperious Wrecked. God bless. That's an amazing oh, no. Twitter handle. Yes. Please tell Nick I love his art and thank him for the best Nightcrawler and Namor art ever. <laughs> also, what comics do you have upcoming in the future that I can check out, he asks. Will you, and then, well, the, the question which we probably can't quite answer, but I'll put it to you anyway. Will you ever work for Marvel and give us the Nightcrawler content we crave? <laughs> so. Oh, uh, well, I just mentioned that I, who I'm working with, but I can't yes. say where or when yet because Got I don't it. know. But uh, as for the Marvel and Nightcrawler stuff, um, uh, my email is right there. <laughs> um, I would be happy to. So actually, I didn't really talk much about your own background as a comics like reader. Like, Did you develop an interest in them as an adult, or had you been reading them for a long time? You know that uh, the comic DNA thing going around, I, I forget who started it, where you post yeah. the... Um, uh, Alex Segura. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, where you post the first comic you remember reading or picking up and then the one that made you a fan for life and then two more extras. And I've, I've had so much anxiety about that thing. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I got into comics older. I, I started working in them and then I got into reading them a lot more. So I made money making them and then just turned it around. <laughs> and uh, That's really cool. Yeah, I, 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 I'm happy to hear that, but I always worry about it. Well, it's interesting just because it means you're coming in to looking at this with a fresh perspective. Like, yes. if you're growing up reading them, then your sense of like who is good and what you want to draw is usually going to be very tied to questions like, what year did you begin reading? Or who was working on what at the time? You know, mm-hmm. um, And then coming in as an adult and as a professional artist, you can kind of say like, oh, okay, these people are acrobatic, do a lot of acrobatic stuff, so I'm going to go draw them because that's a cool thing to draw and have it not necessarily be tied to, like, I don't know, if somebody's younger and they just grew up and Tim Drake is their Robin, like, mm-hmm. and that's just what they're into because Tim Drake is their Robin, then they're missing out on the opportunity to do, like, the way cooler acrobatic stuff that you would actually have with <laughs> Dick Grayson, for example. Mm-hmm. So it, I think it gives you a different and interesting perspective and, and may even have some advantages, actually, as an artist. Yeah, I, I that's my... That's what I tell myself. I'm hoping I come into comics and I'm working on them with a different point of view than most people do. That's that's the positive thing I hope for. The other thing, I just... It's like the fake fanboy thing. I worry about that I haven't read this, that. I haven't read this book. I haven't read this all-time favorite thing. And I I need to get on that. But I'm, I'm making new comics. I'm making... Yes. I'm, I'm making new stuff. And I'm getting the chance to bring diversity and new looks to characters that I know that I I may not be the biggest fan of or I may not know their whole 30, 40 year library, but I'm bringing what I know and what I see in today's time into that book. And that's exciting for me and I know it's, it's, 
I, I don't want to call it a hot button issue, but it's a disgust thing. Disgust, not ew, gross, disgust, but <laughs> it's a topic of conversation. Correct. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, I know that's it's it's that, and mm-hmm. some people. I know it's mostly the older fans and the people who 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 grew up reading them who are comfortable in that type of character or their their vision that they grew up with of so and so but for me coming in as a new reader and for new readers who are younger now being able to see this new stuff and the current events the current just bringing our modern times into characters is great to me i love seeing diversity and updated things more than i love seeing what older things redone or rehashed over and over and if you like that that's totally valid too i'm i'm all for everyone mm-hmm. in, everyone enjoying what they enjoy but, but you're and you're bringing something that there isn't as much of is the thing like there yes. isn't already like I, you know like you're you have a commitment that is not necessarily matched by all other artists and comics to delivering sexy men to the people <laughs> and like there's a school of artists who i think are like deeply allergic to doing that like they think it's like a challenge to their masculinity uh god forbid anybody look thirstily upon these male <laughs> heroes that they grew up idolizing it's very bizarre to me um but i don't understand straight people in general but like the i you know but like this and it's it's which is unfortunate because like we all deserve to be able to look at art that is beautiful on multiple levels and you know you shouldn't have to like not every character in every context should be like done in a sexualized fashion obviously but the oh, yeah. fact that you have this as an element that's and and you 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 know you you're drawing death as well in your comic as well so it's not like you have to do mm-hmm. that in every way in every place but like the fact that you are able to do that and the fact that you also are doing that specifically in art of men is really significant actually i i, I used to um i used to say i wanted to be the adam hughes of guys <laughs> <laughs> that, that was younger me and then you know you know um kevin wada and chris anka and adam hughes himself started just drawing guys like that and it's like oh i i gotta i I'm, i've got good company <laughs> mm-hmm. but yeah i i think the um the um what is it called what is it called um the gaze of female gaze and male gaze and it's I, th- I think it was one-sided until recently, <laughs> and now it's it's getting a little more even. Maybe I don't know. What do you think? I mean, it just it just sort of de- depends on you know the artist a lot. But I think that there's a much better conversation and a lot more uh, female takes that are available now than there were yes. back when it was when it was like there was just Marie I'm not saying that it was ever just Marie Severin but like it kind of I mean way back in the day it kind of was mm-hmm. and um, just for her, Marie Severin Ramona Frandon you know like you have more of a diversity of that and you also have more like you know men who are gay or bisexual or queer identified and more you know as working as well yes and and, and being able to express that in their art yes and that's I love that I love that we can have conversation these days and it's voices are easily heard or more easily heard or accessible now and that's wonderful well you know if you had have advice for our artists on like how do you you know you have like the younger people like the you know they're giving male female whatever they're giving the, the viewer a sultry eye and many of the pinups like how do you do that but you're also doing it in a way that sort of it's not it's not objectifying it's mm-hmm. sexy but it's not objectifying like what what's the secret for you as an artist for achieving that that is a very good question i think i i i wonder if i've seen so much of it done wrong that i know what not to do <laughs> <laughs> so that that plays into it somehow but just maybe not sacrificing humanity will win you everything which yes okay that sounds good <laughs> that, that sounds, sounds too good, good for me <laughs> but yeah, i mean that's still subjective like you know like what makes that yeah it's it's making sure there's life in the eyes it's making sure yeah. you don't break anatomy or forget key components it's it's 
remembering character, or sometimes you can get wishy-washy on the character for like a pinup or something, but if if you want to maintain the characters, um, just their personality, their likes, and what have you, you, you can accessorize a pinup or what they're wearing, which goes back to what we spoke of earlier. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, just making sure their character comes with the pinup, the sexiness, what have you. Make sure it all shows up and it's not just showing <laughs> that uh, that you want to draw something horny or sexual or what have you. It's It's making sure you're drawing a character and not an object. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of like, you know, looking at your art, like, you know, you, you're you're doing sexy pinup nightcrawlers, not the same as your sexy pinup uh, submariner. Like they're they're not addressing the they're not addressing the viewer in the same way. Or yes. Conversely, to someone else, like if your sexy shadow cat looks like your sexy Emma Frost, you're doing it wrong. That's just not. <laughs> yes. It's not the same kind of sexy, and it's not the same approach. They're not the same no. person. They're not the same. And I've seen people do that, my friend. I've seen people do that. <laughs> You have seen that. things. I have seen th- I have such seen things. things. Such things. Um, so yeah, but it's but it really feels like we're really entering. It's true. Like we're entering a period where people are more comfortable talking about that and like mm-hmm. why it matters. And I think I've seen you know different artists who are more old school actually like upping their game with respect to it. And a few have even spoken about it, which I mm-hmm. think is great. Um, talking about how that's made impacted how they've decided to approach their art. So um, yeah, and that's that's all from conversation and this whole new age of artists and creators coming in I, and I love that the older ones who are excited to change and learn something new or work on their craft that's 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 what I want to do I want to be that forever I want to keep learning and keep getting better and I want to usher in new creators or make friendships with creators and learn from them and share what I know that's mm. that's a big thing of um uh, when I worked with Shelley on Euthanauts, I, yeah. I, I've i always been looking for a mentorship because I'm self-taught, we said earlier, but uh, I, I've never really had someone sit down too much with me and point out, this and this is working good, and way to go, Nick, or let's change this and swap this and out, blah, blah, blah. But with Shelley, she really, I don't know if she knows she was a mentor to me, but she she has left me with lessons that I think of every day since working with her and I can't thank her enough that's so awesome she is she is awesome <laughs> I, I loved working with her and she's a friend I like to just say hi once in a while I gotta check in <laughs> actually what was the first what were your first sort of sequential art that you've done like what was the first like comics oh oh it's my first comic was so weird um I <laughs> I think it was uh, 2013. I, I I had no intentions of becoming a comic artist. I did not think I could do it. I thought it was the 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 farthest thing that I could reach for. I never thought about doing it. And then one day I get an email or an email or a um, message on DeviantArt, and it's an editor from Boom. And they asked me if I want to try out for a comic, and I think I was in, or I just come out of, of, of a funk or something, and decided I need to say yes to something. I need to say yes more. I don't need to be scared of this or that. I need to say yes more. So I said yes, and I ended up painting a comic page or two for a, um, for an audition, and that was for uh, the comic Clockwork Angels. Yeah. And I did that with. Um, um, Kevin J. Anderson and Neil Peart from Rush, which is <laughs> my big name drop. Yeah. My first comic was with the uh, famous drummer. But uh, yeah, that was my first comic, and I painted the whole thing. And I jumped in the deep end. I had no idea what I was doing, and I had very patient editors, and my uh, <laughs> they were very patient because I asked for extensions so many times, and just. It was learn on the go. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, like you worked with Neil Peart, like <laughs> from Rush. <laughs> That's amazing. Like, what? Yeah, what is that? What is that like? Like, he's not <laughs> someone from in comics either, so this is probably no. an experience for him too. 
Yeah, I think so. I think that was his first one. It it was Probably. just so weird just having him and Kevin in my email after being a nobody. I mean, I mean I'm not somebody anymore, but just I was not on the scene, I guess. And then yeah. have, having him email me nice sayings or little critiques or questions here and there, that was wild. And I <laughs> I um I just met Kevin the first time this past um Emerald City last year. It's almost Emerald City time again. <laughs> but last year I met him for the first time, and the first thing he mentions is, mentions is that um, uh, Rush was doing their final tour, I think. Yeah. And um, they played in New Orleans, and he, um, Neil invited me down to come see and meet him and stuff. And this was way back before I had a handle on anxiety and stuff, so I had to pass on that. And it's New Orleans is on the other side of the state from me. So mm-hmm. it was a drive. So he, the first time I met Kevin, he was like, yeah, you're the only person I know that would pass that up. <laughs> and I was like, I'm sorry, I know. It, I felt awful because I, I wanted to meet him. But yeah, working with Neil Peart as my first writer collaborator with Kevin was wild. And I'm, I'm happy, though. I'm still happy with a lot of those pages. And that's my, that's my first book. I gotta be proud of my first book. That's awesome, and and also I just think it's so cool that the publisher is like literally like I'm gonna go on Deviant Art and find talented people and like bring them into the industry. <laughs> I know, Deviant Art. Oh man, it's 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 not my one of my main sources anymore. But yeah. I I will never say anything bad about it because it it led me here, and I'm I'm really happy to be here. And I mean, yeah, now who I know. I mean, I guess that's a quite good question, actually, for you, in terms of like, what, like for artists, like, what are the good platforms? Because you always have problems with your art getting reposted without credit, mm-hmm. right? There's other platforms where people will just like give you grief because they're racist or homophobic or what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like, you know, putting your art there in a social media setting, like, what what have you learned from doing that? I have learned that I am very lucky. <laughs> um, I've been I've been lucky, and I say that because I I've I've not had too many trolls or anybody or or aggressive people come at me, and I've had good people come and join me and say hi and show my work around to editors and to other people that have gotten me work. And I'll just Tess Fowler, she is amazing, and she she led me all over the place and made sure I was safe and just checked in all the time and she is she's one of the good ones and I always single her out because she really call, she called me up one day and is just no one has ever really called me or been so direct as she was and she just text or er, um, um, messaged me on Twitter and was like Nick can I have your phone number can I call you and she without even knowing me really she called me up to let me know how good she thought I was and wouldn't let me get off the phone until I told her I thought I was good as an artist and that was just game changing and no one's ever really showed that much blind faith in me so Tess is a huge Tess has a huge chunk of my heart for that and I, I, I've, I've just got to meet her at my first New York Comic Con which was Oh, oh goodness! That was two years ago now, but mm. I got to give her a hug and just it was nice to let her know and meet her. But um, back to your question, you mentioned what would I say to people who wanted to post around or yeah. post online and yeah. get their portfolios out there? Yeah, uh, Twitter is my main hub. That's where I'm always at, and I just started getting into Instagram more. I'm not great at it, but it's seeming to be worth it I've gotten some attention recently and uh, there's a site called ArtStation I think and it's more of a it's got a portfolio thing you can do and it's more for getting work and it, it's more for CG painting and uh, concept art and all that but I've seen a couple of comic artists go to there and I, I think it's worth a shot it may be a little more involved than just Posting. It's not a social media thing, really. I don't think it's more of a forum. Yeah. Hmm. But those are the ones I tend to. I, Twitter.
Twitter is my main thing. I'm, I've happily not had to um, branch out too much. I don't, I don't know if there's much else to branch out to. But I use Twitter and I've I, I, I've been nice, which sucks that you have to say, but if you're nice, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna make um, you're gonna make pals or what have you or just as long as you don't come on too aggressive or anything and just keep um, keep regular with your posting if you can I mean and don't feel like you have to but try and st stay um, up to date with things and if and draw what you want to draw and don't don't um don't get too far of what you want to do or you're going to become someone that you don't like or you're going to get trapped into doing something you're not 100% happy with doing and that's that's not great for a creative but I, some people have to go that route and it's okay but just remember what you love to do don't don't sacrifice it too much and if you keep at it and keep posting and just be nice <laughs> somebody's going to notice you and someone's going to help you out or reach out and give you a hand or at least I, I very much hope so <laughs> because I've had I've had good experiences and I, I want to share that if I can that's one of the main big things I want to do as an artist because I I'm too quiet and I was very lucky that people reached out to me so if I can I, I will pass on the the email or I will show your work to somebody I will help you out if I can it sort of breaks back to an earlier point about drawing different types of bodies, but I, I, you, I've, 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 I've encountered uh, some artists who've claimed more fan, more often fan artists than people who are getting paid to do this work. But I suspect this actually mirrors the thought process of some people who are, um, but who insist that uh, they have a hard time, they have a harder time drawing people who are of different kinds of body shapes and because it's just more difficult for them. Mm -hmm. um, and you're someone whose art is always represented, at least what I've seen, you know, a range of body types and sizes and, you know, like in the big group scenes with lots of, like in, in the big wild sex party scenes and like youth and arts, <laughs> like you have people with all different kinds of dimensions of their body and they're all like being beautiful and having fun and expressing themselves. And um, like, do you think that like there's anything different about drawing one kind of body type versus another or, or like did you just focus on making sure you could do it all or or how did that come for you I I think um I think it's trouble for some people because it's it depending on how you learn to draw if you learn out of an anatomy book which we all do but if you go to any anatomy book or book on figures, most of the time you're going to have 60 odd pages of how to draw the average superhero or average white guy and you're going to put in your 10,000 hours of creative energy to that and get that perfect. Then you have to draw something else and it's like I didn't study for this. So if you if you <laughs> if you do get some books, some of them have all that and then at the end they have like 10 pages of, oh, if you're going to draw someone that's not white or not skinny, not <laughs> in perfect shape, this is what they look like. Here are 15 different pictures. Have at it. And that's all, that's all you get. So you, you don't have that whole formula to draw this type of character, this type of body weight, this, this, this form. You have to make the effort and go in and look and study that area. So I get that it's it's not planned out for you to know that, but neither is drawing a toaster. <laughs> mm. you, you, you can make the choice to go and learn how to draw that, and it's not going to be great at first, but, you know, it's, it's the same thing. You just need to learn where weight is distributed and people wrinkle. <laughs> people have wrinkles. Yeah. People have wrinkles in their stomach, their belly, their legs, or their the arms how they bend and just skin or fat gathers here and there it's you gotta it's not something that is 
in those books, but it's beautiful and um what was I gonna say? I, I had something else to say. <laughs> um it's 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 exciting to draw that. It's exciting to be different and bring that element to figures and just diverse from that that formulated look. And there's there's nothing wrong with the formulated look. I always have to back up and say that because I feel like I have to, but there's nothing wrong with that and there's nothing wrong with this way. Mm -hmm. Just have fun and find the beauty in stuff that isn't a beautiful formula. Hmm. I mean, in looking at, like, to me, there's also something which is more beautiful in, like, art that represents a physical reality of a body that exists, like, you know, the breasts that have weight to them mm -hmm. um, versus, like, breasts that are, like, sort of pneumatically through space um, and, like, don't follow the laws of physics. Like, I just, I don't think that, maybe it's a lack of imagination on my part, but I think it's probably not. I think it's probably has something else to say, but, like, I think that <laughs> breasts that look like breasts are generally sexier than breasts that don't look like they could exist in actual physical space. Like, that's just, that's just I, I, me. I, I, I agree. But, with you. I agree with you. Um, yeah. It, it, there are there are there are endless body types and physicalities and uh, muscle types or people work out differently. You can you can account for all of that if you want to put in the extra effort. Mm -hmm. There's there's tons of exploration things you can do with a with a person's body, which that sounds weird, but. What I mean is drawing them, of course. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but yeah, there's, there, it's endless. You could have so much fun. People, people are not all hairless, perfectly muscle tone, perfect, what have you, um, Rocky <laughs> horror picture show. What is his uh, name's yeah. Rocky, right? Rocky, yes. he is. Yeah, okay. You you can vary out from that. <laughs> And, and it's it's the greatest thing, really. It's I love figures, and if I get too stale, that's that's my favorite thing to venture out to. Let's let's see what else I can bring to my anatomy um, portfolio when I want to draw side characters or characters who aren't here or in the background. What mm. can I represent, and what can I what can I make? What can I um, can I see humanity in this character can i see someone represented can i see myself represented to this character does that make me feel good yes it does i want to do this for more people or more characters let's just populate the comic with a lot of good different different people that's really beautiful thank you so much so let our listeners know where they can find your work online Okay, um, <laughs> uh, like I said, I mostly haunt Twitter, and you can find me at um, Art of Nick Robles, and then I'm on Instagram, and I think that's Nick Robles Art. And I will confirm that <laughs> is Nick Robles Art, N I C K R O B L E S Art. Yes, and then that's the same as my website. Excellent, which I see is nickroblazart.com. I'm uh, well, easy thank to find. You again. Thank you very much for joining us. So uh, everybody, go pick up the uh, trade paperback of Euthanauts when it comes out at the end of this month. I, I just think it's stunning and really interesting comic. Highly endorsed. Um, thank you so much. And it, yeah, it's going to be great to have that out in trade paperback. Just easy. People can pick it up at their, you know, at the bookstore, etc., mm -hmm. and all that, as well as at their local comic book store. Um, and is there anything else that you can that's that that folks can be looking out for? Or is it all still hush hush? Oh, it's it's all hush hush for now. Okay. But I'll, I'll be at Emerald City or Emerald City Comic Con. I don't know how early this is going out. Um. Okay, that's great. Probably before when is Emerald City? I think the 15th of next month. Oh, yes. This will be out long before Emerald City. So okay. folks well, should check there. you out at Emerald City Comic Con. Yes. Yeah, And thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining me. Mm -hmm. uh, so listeners, thank you again. Um, we've got some more comics interviews coming up soon. Uh, and I know we'll be covering on the show. Um, we are going to actually do Punisher Season 2. Yes, this is for sure. And we're going to be covering Doom Patrol very soon as well. Um, curious if folks would be interested in us doing Young Justice Season 3. Uh, shoot me a message if that is something you'd like to do. I'm always trying to determine what is the right balance of comics 
to TV slash film type coverage. Oh, and duh, we definitely are covering Captain Marvel. I have two exciting guests coming on that. Gallery, Valerie Complex will be back, film critic, uh, who was on a show recently to talk about the best films of last year. And also journalist Sarah Jaffe will be joining me for Captain Marvel as well. Um, but I've got another couple comic writers coming up as well as two. So let me know what you think. Uh, as always, check out graphicpolicy.com for comics news and reviews. And I'm on Twitter all the damn time at E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. That's Ilana underscore Brooklyn. Shoot me a message there. Graphic Policy is on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, you name it. Talk to you soon and keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.